listen to another person from the from the Stanford University. Welcome, Cynthia Capon. MD, of course, and a clinical professor at the adolescent Div division at Stanford University. And you are going, you specialize in eating disorders in adolescents, and that's the topic of your speech, your lecture. All right. I am so delighted to be here with you today, and I'm really grateful for saying, for organizing this. I think this is such an important topic. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about abnormal eating behaviors in PANS and diagnosing eating disorders in PANS. I'm also going to talk about the medical problems that are associated with restrictive intake in PANS patients and the approach to treating a child with restrictive intake in PANS. And then finally talk about support from the family. So I think as clinicians, there's always those patients that you'll just never forget. And so my journey into this started with patients that I, I can remember from the very beginning of the time that I started at Stanford. There was this girl with severe malnutrition and she was diagnosed with anorexia and she was so um, compulsive that she was actually jumping up and, up and down off of the toilet until the toilet broke off of the wall. And there was a pattern rug that we had going from the schoolroom back to our unit and it took her forever to go there because she had this whole pattern that she had to go through to get to, to back to our unit. There was a boy with picky eating who we were treating with eating disorder who was doing really well. He was weight restored, doing great. And suddenly I got this call from his father saying that his child had stopped eating and drinking and that his child was down in the basement and he was trying to figure out um, when the aliens were going to bring back his real dad because the person who was speaking to me wasn't really his dad. There was a boy who was referred to me in the eating disorder clinic for severe malnutrition, um, but he, and he definitely met criteria for anorexia. He was really worried about being fat and gaining weight, but he wouldn't swallow his saliva, and he didn't want to take a deep breath because he didn't want to be weighing more because of the breath. And then there was a boy who said that he wouldn't eat until we made his sore throat better. We checked for everything. There was no signs of strep or other issues. Um, but he kept coughing, and we realized that it was a tick. And he said that he wouldn't eat until we stopped the sore throat, but the sore throat wouldn't cough because he kept coughing and coughing. So I was thinking to myself, like, what, what's going on? You know, I've, I've treated eating disorders for so long, you kind of get the script. And these patients just aren't fitting the script for that. And then I realized, it's like all of these patients had OCD. Um, so I've, I've just been really intrigued by these cases that have come up over time, and then I, I ended up having Jennifer Frankovich in the same uh, place where I work, and so we've been talking a lot about these patients, and I realized a number of my eating disorder patients that I was seeing probably also had parents. Um, so that's how I came to this journey. So, as we know, the sudden onset of restricted eating can be a major diagnostic criteria for parents. Children can be restricting fluids, food, or both. There can be a variety of reasons why people suddenly change their eating patterns. It can be because they're actually having difficulty swallowing, because um, there's some sensory alteration, they're tasting food different, the food texture is altered. There can be a fear of contamination or poisoning of the food a fear of choking or vomiting, or they may have a lot of obsessive or ritualistic food uh, eating behaviors that make it difficult for them to eat. There have been two studies of disordered eating in children and adolescents seen in clinic for PANS. One is by Tofexis, Homer, Girardi, and uh, other individuals in 2015, and this is a published report that's out. And in addition, at the Stanford cohort, uh, myself, Jennifer Frankovich, uh, Brianna Peet and Avis Chan have been looking at disordered eating behaviors and re food restriction in a PANS group. In the Tofixis study, they looked at 29 patients with PANS who had new abrupt onset of eating restriction or food avoidance. Age was from 5 to 12, mean age was 9. 69% of these people were male, and all of the children had OCD symptoms. What they found uh, was that contamination fears really seemed to be prominent in these individuals. 41% of the children were afraid of germs, another 10% here were worried that they'd be poisoned, uh, and 14% had other fears, and including fears of allergies or allergens in the food, bleach, illicit drugs, 
or the essence or personality of other people. They also uh, was a number of people who had a fear of vomiting or a fear of choking. And in addition to some other characteristics of the group, 17% of the children were refused to swallow their own saliva. 17% also refused to eat for at least several days. 10% expressed concern about weight or body shape. And 41% of these individuals had sensory sensitivity, though the group didn't necessarily tie it in with whether that was the reason for these children having difficulty eating. We've been looking at our patients as well to see what um, the eating issues are for this population. And we've looked at consecutive patients who were presented to the PANS clinic. Ages range from four to 18, and the criteria was also that they would meet criteria, more strict criteria for PANS. They were excluded at the time interval between symptom onset and the clinic visit was more than five years, or if they declined to, to involvement in the research that was going on at the clinic. So study population was 213 patients. The age of onset for OCD was nine years of age. Age at their first clinic visit was 10. 61% of our patients were male, and 77% were non-Hispanic white individuals. And we found that 47% had eating restriction at their initial presentation to the PANS clinic. There were significant differences when we looked at the population with the eating restriction and compared it to the group of people that did not have eating restriction. We found that there was a significant increase in the number of people who had somatic signs and symptoms, so sleep issues, uh, urinary frequency. There was also a significant uh, the increased number who had a decline in school performance, 59% of those individuals did. There was also a higher likelihood of sensory disturbances in people that had issues with their, their eating. Also higher pre prevalence of behavioral regression. And also of the group that had eating issues in red, 36% of those individuals had had weight loss compared to just 17% of those who reported not having restrictions in their food intake. There was a number of reasons that the children cited for having problems with eating, and I've sort of uh, I've outlined the details of them here on this side, um, but then I've also sort of uh, grouped them in, in bigger sets as well. So we had kids that had issues with obsessives about food types, patterns, texture, taste, um, or just were picky eating or kind of adverse to eating particular types of foods. And I sort of grouped them under selective eating uh, issues for the children. There was another group who had issues about food contamination, so including fears of germs or poisoning, allergens or getting sick from the food. There was also a group of, of individuals who just didn't seem to have any appetite for food or had some dysregulation of their hunger cues, so not, not feeling hungry, feeling full early on. And then we also had a number of children who were afraid of vomiting or choking, or actually felt like there was some trouble swallowing or there was something stuck in their throat, or had a, uh, were spitting up or gagging or had a compulsion of spitting out. And then finally, we had a small group of individuals that also had body image concerns, fear of weight gain or loss. So these are fairly similar to the kinds of findings that Tufexis and, and her group found for the little bit different prevalence in some of them, um, but similar patterns. So the question comes up, and you know, particularly for me in the eating disorder clinic, whether the food restrictions that we see in hands would actually meet criteria for an eating disorder diagnosis. And the question is, perhaps. If so, probably the most likely diagnosis would be avoidant restrictive food in intake disorder, or ARFID, uh, though anorexia nervosa is also possible. Occasionally, you can have excessive eating in, with pans, but it's unlikely to meet the criteria for binge eating disorder. I wanted to talk more about ARFID because I think this is the most likely diagnosis that if you have somebody with pans, they, they might meet these criteria. It's a newly recognized eating disorder, even though we've been actually treating it for a number of years without having this sort of um, category to put these children in. It was included in the 2013 version of the Psychiatric Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Um, 
And we as adolescent medicine physicians and, and also as, as psychiatrists and psychologists are really working to find the best treatment for this disorder. Since it's a relatively newly recognized disorder, there's not uh, the same kind of definitive treatments that have been outlined for ARFID that we have for some of the other eating disorders like anorexia or, or bulimia. So there's people very actively working on this. There's a number of randomized chemical control trials going on. There's some at Stanford that are in progress. And also from the adolescent medicine side, there's the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine that's an international organization. And within that society, there's a group of us that have formed a, quality, a national eating disorder quality improvement collaborative. And there's 18 sites in the United States and Canada. And we're working together to look at uh, the different sites, we've all kind of been winging it and putting together our own uh, protocols for treating children with ARFID. And we're, tr we're collecting the data from these different sites and looking at our different practices and, and trying to share our ideas amongst each other. And we're also hoping in the future to develop more standardized ways to track our patients so that we can really see which of these treatments are most effective for the patients with ARFID. Um, so it's, it's, an, it's an evolving field, and it's not as well-defined what the treatment is for this, um, but we're working hard on it right now. But we do know that as compared to other eating disorders, patients with ARFID tend to be younger. There's a higher percentage of individuals who are males. Um, hang on a minute. Uh, and they also tend to be more on the anxiety spectrum rather than the you know, people with anorexia and depression tend to be maybe more on the mood disorder spectrum. And they're also more likely to have other medical problems. ARFID is characterized by the per persistent failure to meet appropriate nutritional or energy needs. And then you also have to make these criteria at least one of the following, either significant weight loss or lack of expected gain, Significant nutritional deficiency, dependence on oral supplements or tube feeding, or marked interference with psychosocial functioning. So I think when you think of your uh, individuals that you see with PANS or if your family members who have children with PANS, it's very likely that they might meet one of these criteria. The key is also that they have no disturbance in their body image, so they're not worried about being uh, bad, and that's not the driver for why they're restricting their intake. And then this is the tricky one, because it, it's not really clear from this whether a child with PANS would fit into this or not, if this is the, the caveat to this. The eating disturbance is not attributable to a concurrent medical condition or not better explained by another mental disorder. And we all know with PANS, this is a medical disorder uh, and a psychiatric illness. But if the eating disorder is recurring in the context of another condition, well, then the severity of that eating issue exceeds that that's routinely associated with the condition or warrants additional clinical attention. So if you have somebody with more significant eating problems, they may very well meet criteria for being diagnosed also with ARFID. Uh, occasionally we also have individuals who meet criteria for anorexia nervosa. So this is in addition to the restriction of energy intake relative to the requirements there's a significant weight loss or low body weight, and there's also this intense fear of gaining weight or becoming fat. Why does it matter if we're really diagnosing a person with an eating disorder or not? Well, one is that you can take advantage then, and if you have somebody that has an eating disorder, of the more evidence-based treatment protocols for treating that disorder, even though there are some nuances in how you treat it differently with PANS, and I'll be getting into that in a few minutes. And, and also, from my perspective, I have patients that are coming to me and people are telling me that they think they have an eating disorder and I realize they have PANS. So I think it's also really um, important to get the message out that there's children with PANS who may actually meet criteria for eating disorders, uh, but we need to pick up that they have PANS as well and really need to get on it so we're able to provide appropriate treatment for the PANS aspect of their illness as well. And finally, even if they don't fit into one of these eating disorder boxes, if there's a child that has significant problems with eating and pants, that's a significant problem and it needs to be addressed. When you look at whether there could be potentially medical complications from the eating issues in children with pants, we find that the risk of medical instability with any child who has malnutrition and restricted eating will increase if there's more extreme restriction of food or fluids, if the restriction of food or fluids is more prolonged, 
If there's a larger proportion of weight loss, so somebody who's six and loses a couple of pounds, that's gonna be a bigger deal than if somebody's 15 and, and loses a couple of pounds. And then finally, the rapidity of the weight loss also is more likely. If somebody's losing weight more quickly, they're more likely to become medically unstable. If somebody is losing or restricting food or, or fluids significantly, they should be seen by a medical provider and the, the provider should assess initially and should also be following this patient over time um, to make sure that they're not running into problems with this. We want to look for physical signs of malnutrition and dehydration, follow the weight trends over time, and we do vital signs. Orthostatic pulse and blood pressure are particularly helpful for individuals with malnutrition and also with dehydration. We do the blood pressure and pulse with patients lying down for five minutes, and then we have them stand up, and two minutes later, we recheck pulse and blood pressure. A lot of times, one of the earlier markers for children who are becoming medically unstable from either dehydration or from malnutrition is that they have a significant increase in their pulse or a significant drop in their blood pressure. Also, we check temperature. We look at electrolytes, and phosphorus and magnesium are also really um, important to be including as well during both the malnutrition phase and then if somebody's become quite malnutrition, malnourished and then we refeed that individual, you can have something called refeeding syndrome that can be quite dangerous in children that have been malnourished. Um, and so the phosphorus and magnesium are elements that can get abnormal in that as well. And initially we do an AKG looking for rhythm abnormalities and also for uh, prolonged QTC or, or other sort of patterns in the electrical conduction that might predispose somebody to having heart rhythm abnormalities. So the medical complications, all organs can be affected by restriction of food and fluids. The changes that we see in the heart rate, the blood pressure and temperature can be due to malnutrition, dehydration, weight loss or vomiting. And uh, the orthostatic pulse increase in blood pressure and drop is quite common. It's also important to notice that the patients, even if they're normal weight or even overweight, can develop the same medical complications as children who are underweight if they've had significant restriction or weight loss. You can envision that if you're not getting enough nutrition or energy, it's kind of like you have this hibernation response that happens. And just like bears, when they hibernate during the winter, they want to really conserve all the energy so that they're able to make it through the winter. And we see the same thing in children who are malnourished. There's a lowering of the heart rate, there's a lowering temperature, and lower blood pulse. And this is all actually adaptive. It's a way that the body conserves energy so that somebody's able to survive over time. Uh, the blood flows primarily, you want the heart to keep going, you want the brain to keep going. Hands, feet, they're kind of extra. You don't really need to focus on that, so the body's really focused on the, the most important organs. And in particular, growth and development is put on hold. Um, so we see potentially loss of menstrual periods, and over time also there's a stunting of height if people remain malnourished for a more prolonged period of time. Dehydration is also a, a very serious condition for children and it can cause inadequate blood flow to all of the organs. With the brain, the most likely symptoms might be dizziness or fainting. The heart and circulation can also be affected so you can have a rapid heart rate with that, low blood pressure and potentially collapse. Kidney and liver can both be damaged by a, a lack of perfusion with that and ultimately uh, you may have failure of the organisms. And if not, reverse dehydration can cause shock, coma, or even death. The approach that you take with restricted intake in a child with PANS is you want to seek expert care for the PANS symptoms, but also for the disordered eating if it's significant enough. So your team might include a medical provider, a psychologist or psychiatrist, dietitian and an occupational therapist or speech therapist or somebody who might be used to working with children who are having sensory or taste or issues with, with food intake. And if the symptoms are significant, you might have actually two groups of people, two experts working with the child over time. If children are severely restricting their intake or become medically unstable, they might actually require hospitalization for medical complications and treatment of those. With the PANS patients, uh, first and foremost, one of your biggest priorities is to treat the underlying inf infection or inflammation. And then fortunately, we have this expanding uh, evidence base of information that we can use to talk about treatments, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the later parts of this 
conference so I can hear more about some of the treatments that are being used now. And then if the obsessions or compulsive, uh, compulsive activities are interfering with eating, psychiatric medications may be helpful. I've talked with the psychiatrist in our group and, and she's noticing it. I don't think there's great uh, any sort of evidence that's been put out to this, but she just feels like when we have children that are admitted to our inpatient eating disorder unit, she notices that for the children that have PANS, it seems like oftentimes they'll actually respond quite well to some of the psychiatric medications. We tend to be fairly minimalistic in using psychiatric medications with our uh, children with eating disorders, um, but she's actually more inclined to use it with children that have PANS because she's, she's seen that it's made a difference um, that's been fairly significant for some of those children. And then also, if somebody's significantly malnourished, they might not have the same response that you would want for a psychiatric medication. So over time, getting somebody to be in a more appropriate place nutritionally might actually also have a significant improvement in some of their psychiatric symptoms, um, just alone apart from that, and also make them more responsive to any medications that are used. <clears throat> We also work a lot with individuals who are struggling with eating issues, um, especially if they're anxious or nauseous or afraid of choking or vomiting, whether it's associated with PANS or whether it's a child who's having eating issues with these problems not associated with PANS. And we've found that there's a couple of key things that can be really, really helpful with these kids. We have an occupational therapist who's terrific at working with our children, and she works a lot just on posture and breathing and relaxation with the kids. And what happens when, when somebody's feeling like they're gonna be vomiting or anticipating vomiting, there's a whole change in posture. You tend to go forward more, you tend to hunch up more, and there's this whole sort of circuit that gets activated where the body is like ready to, ready to be thrown up. So if you can get somebody to sit back and relax more and do deep breathing and relaxation, that kind of counters that whole cycle and it can actually in and of itself help decrease the nausea and the likelihood that the child might be vomiting. So she has all of our kids that are working on these issues in the hospital to be sitting in a chair, to be doing their eating, feet on the floor, trying to get them to relax as much as possible. And a lot of fun, and patients and families actually find that to be very helpful. Other interventions that we use with that, there's some acupressure points. There's one that you can use, you're supposed to be able to do three fingers, she does it better than me, but I'll give you the highlights. Uh, three fingers and then you put your thumb here and there's a little, an area that's an acupressure point that, that you can do some circular motions to um, and some patients find that really helpful. There's also an anti-nausea electrical stimulation uh, band that, uh, that we use in our, uh, our inpatient unit. It, it gives these, it, it's the same sort of idea as the acupressure points but it provides electrical stimulation. Um, some patients love it and it makes such a difference for them and they get a huge relief from the nausea. Other patients, it just drives them crazy. It's this little thing that buzzes and it, and it doesn't work for them at all. We have, we have one that, that couple that we bought for the unit and we lend them out to patients so that they can try them and see if they're ones that get helped by it or one of the ones that just really doesn't like it at all. And then the families, if, if it's working for them, can, can buy it themselves. They're pricey, but if it's somebody that it works for, it can be a, a worthwhile investment. And then aromatherapy can also be really useful. Things like peppermint oil, there's certain scents that some children find really helpful and that can help them with their nausea. We also have some children that really benefit from behavior modification plans, so seeing things that are really concrete goals. A lot of times it's just so discouraging and the families feel really discouraged. They come in with a child that just doesn't seem like they're eating anything and the child themselves is very discouraged as well. And so if you have really clear incremental goals that you're able to put down for a child, they see themselves, and you want the goals to be ones that they can, they can really achieve. And then that success builds on itself, and it really empowers both the child and the family to be able to see that, yes, they can expand what they're eating, and yes, they can be able to get the nutrition that they need. Um, and that can be a very empowering for, for everyone there. The approach that we use for feeding individuals that have difficulty uh, with our food in general and including the children with PANS uh, with, with intake issues are to be flexible in the types of foods or fluids that are provided. Um, not eating is not an option. We need to, to get nutrition in somehow, but it's okay to drink your nutrition. It doesn't have to be food in the beginning. And we're, we're, with many patients, we find that liquid nutrition, nutritional supplements are very helpful. Um, you can 
hopefully do it orally, just by having the child uh, drink it. Occasionally we'll need to use nasogastric feeding tubes for individuals, but it's actually fairly uncommon to have to do that. A lot of times, with a lot of support from family and staff, we're able to get the child to, to drink the nutritional supplements. We're also more creative <clears throat> about the types of nutritional supplements, particularly with PANS. A lot of the children are so um, sensory focused. There's you know, one type of nutritional supplement will work, Ensure, Boost, Scansion, all the different ones. We just, or milkshakes or things that families make up on their own. We get kind of creative about the different things that we'll try with this group. And we're much, much more flexible about getting input from the families about the child's preference and listening to the child about the, what their preferred foods are and starting with those safe foods and then expanding it over time. Occasionally, we might need to use uh, IV fluids if they're dehydrated and not drinking, and very, very rarely we use total parental nutrition. If you had somebody who truly was not um, eating for a prolonged period of time, you might consider that. If, I think we've only had a couple of patients ever that we've needed to use that for. And then the other thing that's, that's important to, to recognize about PANS is things are so fluid and so moving. So with these patients, when we have them in our hospital and are treating them for their feeding issues, things may change, not just day to day, but like hour to hour. So our dietitian and occupational therapist are working a lot with these children to try to, to look for opportunities when they might be able to expand what they're eating and, and diverse, diversify or change with that. If you have a child with food or fluid aversion, it's important to balance the accommodation with exposure with any sort of um, uh, things that you're trying to avoid with children in general. They tend to get bigger the more you're avoiding them. So we try to do exposures with those children as well. Um, but we start with safe foods and then use the liquid nutritional supplements if they're necessary and then progress to gradual exposure to foods or situations that can cause fear or anxiety within a, a framework that's supportive and encouraging incremental progress. Some, some kids, once their acute flare of their pants is better, their issues are totally resolved, they're fine. But you should also look for kids, if they seem like they're still having issues with eating issues beyond the acute pants flare, those might be individuals who actually need to get specific treatment for an eating disorder. Um, and then if so, then look for an evidence-based treatment model for treating the eating issues in that child. Family involvement is so valuable for these kids. We've, um, in the Stanford program, we have a very strong sort of bias towards family-based treatment in general. Jim Locke um, he works, uh, there was a, the Modsley model in England that seemed very promising for having families be involved in the care of children with eating issues. And he uh, and Daniel Grange brought this model back to the United States. And we were working, doing the medical follow-up for the patients, and we were just astonished at how valuable it was to have the family involved with their feeding. Because initially, when it came to Stanford, families were excluded from the feeding process. Um, so we've completely revamped all of our programs within the eating disorder uh, inpatient and outpatient side to really support a family model of uh, treating children with eating disorders. Um, and we find that that's very helpful for children with ARFID as well. Um, a lot of times families will know the preferred food and drinks for the children. Um, so when we have families come, with children come into the unit and be on our ward, we'll work a lot with the families. With the patients that have anorexia and bulimia, we are very directive of what the children are eating. But for the families that have ARFID, um, we usually incorporate input from the family and child for the treatment of, um, that, of what we're, we're providing for the child to eat. Um, children also may need extensive encouragement and support um, to eat and drink, so a lot of time family members can have the patience and endurance to be able to support their child with the refeeding with that. And then also the separation anxiety that the children feel with pants may make it difficult for them to be away from family members. The principles of the family-based therapy are really useful to be treating the disorder, so I, I started to talk about some of those, but it's basically to have the power, the parents be the people who are empowered to be in charge of meals for the child. It's also one of the concepts is externalizing the illness. So we don't blame the child for the illness, but we do blame the illness for, for making it difficult for the child to be eating. So whenever the child is struggling, we really try to focus on it's the illness, it's not the child, and do what we, we need to to support the child. And then it's also a very pragmatic approach to treating eating disorders. We don't really need to know why the child's not eating. 
but what we need to do is figure out ways to get the child to be able to eat, eat more. And then just finally to acknowledge that the burden on caregivers can be really extensive with parents and that parents need self-care as well. It can be quite exhausting. And some references for you with this. Uh, the PAN specific resources are ones uh, Jennifer Frankovich has already talked about, the, the consensus uh, approach to, to treating uh, PANs, and then also the Tofixa study we've cited. The work that we're doing uh, is not published yet, but hopefully will be in the future. Um, and then for things that are more eating disorder specific, not necessarily focused on PANs, um, there's an overview of avoidant restrictive food intake disorder in children and adolescents that I was uh, involved in publishing. And then Jim Locke, it's also not specific to PANS, but he gives a really terrific overview of the evidence-based models for treating eating disorders. And then uh, Neville Golden and others within the Society for Adolescent Medicine have some really good documents out for how to, how to manage eating disorders in general, not specific to PANS. Thank you. Does this mean that most of your patients are hospitalized? No, we've got in our program, most of our patients are actually treated as outpatients. Okay. Um, and there's a small set. In our program, we have uh, uh, outpatient psychiatry and adolescent medicine clinic. And then for children who are acutely medically unstable because of their eating disorder, we hospitalize those patients. We actually don't have any specific program for hospitalizing kids with PANS, and I think that that's a, a problem that maybe a lot of clinicians in this room are struggling with. There's really not great units that uh, bridge the gap between children that have both medical and psychiatric problems, um, and we've had a lot of problems in our hospital with, with children with PANS. They are so challenging to treat, and a lot of times, You'll fix the acute medical problem and live with the patient, but they have so much psychiatric problems that are continuing on. We don't have a psychiatric unit in our hospital, and we're not able to, to hospitalize children with psychiatric issues. So all of the past patients that we have treated on our inpatient unit have all been children who have become medically unstable because of their eating issues. And then I have a very specific question, and, and I think the bottom line is, uh, would you would you say that restricting eating in pants is a variety of obesity? Because uh, Gunilla made, uh, told me that he, we see a lot of young people who seem to have thought disturbances such as I have this voice telling me I'm not allowed to eat or if yeah. I eat that my family yeah. is going to be hurt and so on. Yeah. So is it something that you see and is it a variety of obesity? I, I'm actually really interested by this myself, and I was talking with some other people actually at the dinner last night. I haven't actually, all of the patients that I've seen who I think have PANS have OCD as, as an issue. I've never seen a child that I thought have, has PANS where I've just had the eating issues. They've always had OCD. But I've also been really struck by how subtle it can be to pick up the OCD in the patients. And it's not, a lot of times the children are thinking about things and I have no idea what they're thinking about. And then over time, I realize, oh, that, that must have been something compulsive that was going on that was getting in the way of them being able to drink or there's some pattern or ritual that they had to do before this. So I, I've been really struck at how subtle the, the compulsive symptoms can be of this. And I, I'm not sure myself. I think it's a really interesting area to be exploring. When you assess the patients, what uh, well, you gave us a list, but what made you think of the pants? What? So what I mean, you know, all of the patients that I see, they're coming in because people think they have an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. So what triggers me to look for, geez, I wonder if I've got a pants patient here, um, is if I hear um, that there's a history of OCD, that's a big, major red flag, then I really try to delve more in looking for that. I, I took a sabbatical time and I worked with Jennifer Frankovich in her clinic, so I got to, got to learn all the tricky things that she does on the physical exam, so I've incorporated that into my physical assessments that I do on the new patient. And I've actually found a number of patients, particularly with the more choreoform movements um, that I'm finding on exam, or I'm, I'm finding some signs of rheumatologic issues, um, back, you know, the joint pain that uh, Dr. Frankovich was talking about, I'm, I'm incorporating that into my exams now, I didn't used to do that routinely. 
Um, and also asking about um, some of the more rheumatologic signs that she was noticing in the history for the patient. I'm also doing a better job with my family history and asking about rheumatologic disorders in the family, other psychiatric illness in the family, and autoimmune disorders in the family. Um, so that, that's really changed my practice. I think another of the big flags is just when I see something kind of bizarre in the patients. If I have a patient that's not breathing because of the way more, that's just not, that's not a, a typical thing that I see in my patients. So if there's ever anything that seems a little bit off, then I, then I look more for pans. And then also, you know, the people that I work with on the inpatient unit that work with patients, they'll come to me and they'll say, you know, this child's not responding the way that I think that they should be to the treatment that I'm doing. Can, can you go in and get a little bit more history and wondering if there might be something else going on? Um, and for some of those kids, they've had pants as well. One of the conclusions I made when, when listening to you is that there probably are a lot of under, uh, undetected cases mm -hmm. of pants. Yeah. At, uh, at uh, eating disorder clinics. Yeah, yeah, and some of the cases that I showed you in the beginning, you know, that was way before we knew about pans. And in retrospect, I think, oh my gosh, I, yeah, I bet that child really had pans. Yeah. And then the last question, maybe I uh, know we don't have a lot of time, but I know Jennifer Frankovich was uh, telling, uh, talking about it, and you said also that the, the, the main patients are in majority. The per percentage. That, well, you know, in my, I'm an analyst of medicine physician, so I know PANS is basically like a childhood illness, mm -hmm. but I see, and I think that the other problem that I have is, you know, Jennifer's getting patients that are sent to her new onset patients. I'm getting patients that have been sick for a while. And so I'm also finding, you know, it's probably more complicated to be treating the kids with eating issues. And when I talk to families, I'm finding that, yeah, they've got eating issues now, but I look back in time, and you can see that they probably, as childhood, and during childhood, actually had episodes of PANS before the time that I'm seeing them in the clinic. But yes, I, I just, my focus is in adolescent medicine, so it's a different population that has probably already run through. Yeah, but um, why are males in, ma in majority? Do you have, why, is, why are male patients? Boys more than them. oh males the yes. yes I bet Jennifer could tell you I you know I, I don't know myself <laughs> she's, um, she's shredding I, I, I wonder I think I'll we'll listen to the other speakers I'll have to yeah, but, okay. it, but it is striking with ARFID there's still the, most of the patients with ARFID are still female um, but there's more males with ARFID than there are um, with anorexia with leukemia okay thank you so much thank you.